well continuing in the life and death of Mr. Batman this evening. Recall our last time together we heard Wise speak to Attentive and how Batman was not only deceptive towards his creditors, or those who loaned him money, as we've seen previously, but he was also deceptive with his customers and the merchants that he bought from and, and did business with as well. You remember he had unequal weights and scales, unequal weights and measures to use uh, so that he would deceive and make more money off of those he was doing business with. And upon Mr. Wise giving his scriptural rebuke for such passages or from such passages in the Old Testament, uh, you remember he also went forward to mention passages from the New Testament that condemns dishonesty, lying, deceitfulness, fraud, and so forth. And he did so because while he knew that attentive did not believe this foolish nonsense in his words, he knew that attentive might bring up a possible objection uh, that all he had brought up were Old Testament passages and not from the New Testament at all. Certainly there are some professing Christians today who think the Old Testament law and its commands have no bearing uh, upon us anymore in the New Covenant. Uh, there are some people who call themselves pastors today who will tell you that we need to unhitch uh, from the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament in its entirety from them is literally not for us at all uh, with no benefit. We, we would be fine with just a, uh, just a New Testament and, and that would be it. And you have some who will tell you that the only time we can know that the Old Testament has relevance for us in the law is when something is expressly repeated in the New Testament. So I can only know if it's, if it's for me if, if I see it repeated again in the New Testament. But as Wise says in the narrative, that is foolish nonsense. Uh, it's, it's unbiblical nonsense. And as I mentioned last week, for this evening, uh, I just want to focus on and give a biblical case, a biblical showing for why God's law does continue in the New Covenant. And then broadly we can look at and show how we apply the law, the Old Testament law and its commands and its fulfilled expression in Christ. And so when it comes to the continuance of the law in the New Covenant, I, I just have two headings for this. Uh, and really, they're, they're ultimately, you could sum it down to, uh, God shows that this would be in the Old Testament, and then he shows that this is in the New Testament. Uh, really, I mean, I have a, a longer way of expressing that, but that's really what it comes down to. Uh, the first heading, and as I have it written, God promises multiple times in the Old Testament that his law will continue in, in the New Covenant. Now, I have that uh, majority-wise through through the prophets showing that. So if you want to turn with me in this, as I read through this and show this in, in different ways, you can turn to Jeremiah 31. That is the new covenant promise in uh, the Old Testament, the promise through the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, here we have really the most significant text in the Old Testament on the new covenant. It's the only one that uh, you know, expressly says the words new covenant. Uh, but in Jeremiah 31, verse, verse 31 to 34, the word of the living God declares, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know. And from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So the wonderful promises there in the new covenant, the same covenant that our Lord Jesus purchased for us on the cross. We uh, hear those words every Lord's Day in the afternoon when we, when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, from 1 Corinthians 11:25, 25, uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, the Lord Jesus purchased this new covenant uh, that was promised to us from the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah. He purchased it for us through his death on the cross, which means, church, that though the Lord promises this, as it is written and, and given through the prophet Jeremiah in that time, uh, though, though he promises it to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, we understand from the entirety of Scripture that this is not a promise strictly to those who are ethnically a part of those nations, but this is a promise to all, all of the actual people of God, all, all of true Israel, those who are truly His, uh, which is why, I would add, why the writer of Hebrews takes this promise in Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10. He, he repeats it, he repeats it, and, and without hesitation, he applies it to the church. He doesn't 
come up with some theology that says, well, the new covenant is only for people who are ethnic Israel. No, it's for all who are true Israel, all of the people of God. So if you be in Christ this evening, if you're, if you're in Christ and trusting yourself to Christ, a part of the people of God, then you're a part of this covenant and these promises are for you. The Lord Jesus purchased these promises for you, for all of his people on the cross. And what we find in this covenant is that far from God taking his law away, right, and just saying, well, we're, you know, you're not under law anymore. Uh, that, that's a mistake, um, a, a mistaken understanding of what Paul's saying there in Romans. He's not saying that, that we're not under the law in the sense that it goes away. He's saying that we're not under the condemnation of the law anymore. Far from taking it away, he actually enables his covenant people to keep and uphold his law with stronger force. He enables and upholds his people to keep it with stronger force. For no longer is his law on the outside of us, but in the new covenant, it's within, right? That's what he promises. In the old covenant, God revealed his law to his people and writing with his very own finger into stone tablets, the Ten Commandments, uh, the summarization of his moral law. Then Moses wrote the rest of the statutes, the uh, the interpretation of his moral law and how uh, that would work out in uh, in the civil law or the judicial law. Uh, what what you know? For example, what do you do if somebody murders someone? What do you do if somebody steals and so forth? Moses wrote those out in, in the judicial law and in the ceremonial law and the aspects of worship and so forth. He wrote that for the rest of the people of Israel in a book. And so, in the old covenant, God's law was primarily on the outside of His covenant people as a whole, and as it was. Not everyone in this covenant actually knew God in the sense that they were like actually his, actually you know, converted and longed to serve him, longed to follow him by faith. Now, in this covenant, in the nation of Israel at that time, you have a mix of true believers and unbelievers, uh, but, but not so in the new covenant. Not so in the new covenant. In this covenant, our God says that no longer uh, shall people have to teach or encourage his neighbor or his brother to know the Lord, because all in this covenant will know him. All of them. All in this covenant will have uh, what that means to know God. We've mentioned this before through different sermons and so forth, but to know God means to be in an intimate relationship with him. It doesn't mean, oh, I just know something about him. All, all knowing him means uh, we know him in an intimate way, in a saving relationship. We're friends of God. Right? Uh, the Good Shepherd says in John 10, 14, speaking of his sheep, I know them and they know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. There's a way that we know him that is an intimate way, a, a relational way, a saving way, a friendly way. And all in this covenant will know him. Because in contrast to the old covenant, no longer is his law on the outside, but the law is placed by God within all members of the new covenant as he personally writes it on their hearts. And further in this, no longer will there be the continual remembrance of sins, and the ongoing sacrifices, but as Christ will come forth to purchase the new covenant and sacrifice himself once for uh, all time for all of his people, well, this is why we're told within this promise that our God will forgive our iniquity and he will remember our sin no more. No longer will he remember our sin in this new covenant. And certainly it's not that he just outright forgets. Uh, our God knows everything, but this, this language of him not remembering brings to us the understanding that in this covenant, our God will never treat us as our sin deserves, ever. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, Romans 8, 1. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Christ, who has purchased the new covenant for our sake, God takes away our sin. He takes away the judgment that we deserve for our sin, as Christ has died the death that we deserve for such. And then in the giving of eternal life through Christ's eternal righteousness, our God enables us to live that eternal life out by placing within us his law. By placing within us his law, granting the new birth and placing within our new hearts his law within. In doing so, he gives us new desires. New desires that love him and thus long to obey his commands in our life. And so if you're not in Christ this evening, may you turn to him while God has given you time. May you turn to Christ and live while God has given you time, while he's given you this evening to to hear his call, to repent, to hear his call uh, of, of what comes to those who are in the new covenant. Because apart from Christ, you will never want to follow God's commands for the right reason. You may follow them externally, but you will not have a heart that desires and longs to serve him. You won't have a heart with his law placed within where you want to follow the law. You want to obey his commands. 
apart from coming to Christ, you are selfishly at enmity with God, your enemies with him in your mind. You don't want to serve him. You just want to follow a way that seems right to you. But if you are in Christ this evening, you have God's law written in your heart. If you're a Christian this evening, God's law is written in your heart. This very moment has been written uh, in your new heart that he's given you since conversion. And thus you have new desires to serve God rightly from the heart. No longer, 1 John 5, 2, are his commands burdensome to you. No longer are they burdensome to you. You want to follow them. You don't want to sin any longer. You want to live out his law and commands for your life. Because in Christ, the law just doesn't go away, church. Far from it, it gets even closer. In the new covenant, it's within. It gets even closer. It gets even more. We're even more enabled as God's people to keep it. On the cross, our great God and Savior, our King, Christ Jesus, purchased that truth for us that was promised in Jeremiah 31. And then secondly, I got three texts we'll look at in this. Then secondly, continuing to see this, you can turn with me to Ezekiel 36. That's a, another wonderful new covenant promise from God. Uh, Ezekiel 36, and I'll begin in verse 21. And in leading into the context, into this verse, is the fact that God's covenant people of Israel at this time were not following him. Uh, they were committing spiritual adultery against him and serving other idols, serving other false gods. And so the Lord has in judgment scattered them amongst the nations out of the land that he originally had, had given to them. They profaned his holy name. They had no concern for the ascribing glory to and the exaltation of the Lord our God, Yahweh, and his holy name and, and his, uh, his righteous worship as he is ordained. But yet beginning in verse 21, the Lord says, but I had concern for my holy name. They didn't have concern for his holy name, but he did. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. I'll stop there and, and, and mention that, that that's not talking about actual water. That's talking about spiritual cleansing. Uh, in Titus 3, 5, Paul talks about the washing of regeneration, the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. That's what this is talking about. Uh, John 3, 5 says we must be born of the water and the spirit or of the water, even the spirit. He's talking about this, again, this spiritual cleansing that comes from the spirit that we'll further see in this, in this promise that the spirit is promised. But you see that cleansing language as well in Ephesians 5, right? Christ washes his church with the water of the word, right? By the work of the spirit and the water of the word, we're washed. That's what the sprinkling clean water on us is, is referring to. This isn't talking about actual water and baptism or something like that. A, a, a spiritual baptism, maybe you could say. But he says, I, I sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. See, th this is a water that actually cleanses you from the inside. It cleanses you from your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. I'll stop there. And church, he's not talking about some new statutes or some new rules or some new commands. He's talking about the statutes and rules that they were currently disobeying. They were profaning his holy name by not obeying his statutes and commands. But in this, in this new promise, along with the new covenant, he's going to cleanse us from our uncleannesses. He's going to give us a new spirit. And he's going to cause us to walk in these statutes and to walk in these rules, to be careful to obey his rules. These rules that were commanded to keep by him through Moses. He's talking about his law here. And here, similarly to what we heard from God through Jeremiah, here through Ezekiel, God makes very clear that he's going to do a special work in his people that is different from before. There's something new here that he's doing that he had not done before, and it's because of what God will do through his people in the new covenant, vindicating his holiness through them, that they will no longer be those who seek their own ways. They'll no longer be those who profane his name. 
but they will be those who by his grace and power are cleansed from idolatry. God is going to cleanse his people spiritually, every single one of them. Right? Again, uh, this happens to all of his people. All are cleansed in this way, not just some of them. Just as he said through Jeremiah, he will give them all a new heart. This is that new heart that his law is written on. This new heart that his law is written on. And along with that, not only is he giving them a new heart, but he's placing his spirit within them who will cause them to walk in and to, to live out his statutes and to be careful to obey his rules. In other words, his law, his, his commands. So not only is God placing his law within his people and writing it on our hearts in the new covenant, beloved, giving us new hearts to know him and to love his law, but going along with this, he is further giving them, uh, giving us in his new covenant, his spirit, who will also be within us to cause and accomplish this good work, that we would be careful to obey and keep that very same law. So again, church, far from taking his law away, God is doing a sovereign work in the hearts and minds of his people to see to it that his law is upheld and ever remembered by them. He places his law within a new heart uh, that he has given us. No longer do we have stony hearts against him. We have new hearts of flesh. His law is within, and he gives us a spirit to further enforce that as well. He gives us a, a new heart with his law within, and his spirit causes us, compels us to keep that law that he has placed within Far from taking away, he, he enforces it and upholds it uh, even more in the new covenant. Uh, and then thirdly, continuing this, uh, if you'll turn with me to a text that uh, Nathan began with, Isaiah 2. In Isaiah 2, we furthermore see the continuance of God's law, just as he mentioned then. Uh, the, the continuance of God's law for his new covenant people to disciple the nations with. And uh, you recall it's a text that we've mentioned before on the Lord's Day mornings in 1 Peter. And looking at what will be in the last days, right? The latter days, according to Scripture. One of these things we, uh, we see uh, will be in these latter days uh, is this very thing, the law going forth from God's church. Isaiah 2, verse 2 to 4, I'll just read. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So, church, as we mentioned a few Lord's days ago, a part of God's plan in these last days in which we live is that the nations would be discipled through his church. God's plan is the church. It's his household. It's a special place in all of creation in which he is communed with in which we come and, and, and specially commune with our God. Biblically, we are, you know, to go through these phrases that it speaks of here in these promises, we are the end times temple, we are the house of the Lord, right? 1 Peter 2, 5, we're being built together as a, into a spiritual dwelling place. 1 Peter 2, 5, uh, we are, our first, and also 1 Corinthians three sixteen. Uh, do you not know that you are the temple of God, that you is plural, all of us are the temple of God together? Uh, we are Zion, Hebrews 12, verse 22. We have come to, uh, to Zion, the mountain of the living God. Uh, we, are, we are the new, or also it's called the heavenly Jerusalem. Paul teaches that in Galatians 4. We're the, the Jerusalem from above, the heavenly Jerusalem, Galatians 4, 26. And then Revelation 21, verse 9 to 10. Right in that, in that vision, uh, John is told that he's going to see the bride of the Lamb, but then he sees the city come down, the New Jerusalem. Because the New Jerusalem is the bride of the Lamb. It is a representation of the people of God. We are the, the New Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. And thus, it is his New Covenant church, his New Covenant people today in Christ Jesus that is the one place, again, in all the world wherein God specially communes with his people and through them is conquering and discipling the nations. Through his church, through his house, his mountain, his new Jerusalem, he is conquering and discipling the nations, especially communing with his people. For all, all the nations, as we read in Isaiah, all the nations shall flow to his church, shall flow up to the mountain of God, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk 
It is paths. How do they learn that? How do they learn that? Just from the New Testament? Is that how they learn just his ways and his paths? How do they learn how to walk in the paths of God? Well, he tells us, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. For out of Zion shall go forth the law of our God. Not some, some new thing, but the law that he has already given. The word of the Lord will go from Jerusalem. So you cannot properly disciple the nations as commanded and promised by our Lord here in Isaiah 2, apart from teaching his law. You're not properly deciding the, the nations, the people of God, if you're not teaching his law, if you're not bringing forth his law out of Zion. Those who, who would say we should unhitch from the law, from the Old Testament, and that it's not for us today, church, they're, they're not showing forth, uh, nor living, uh, living out what our God has promised would be in the latter days in his new covenant church. They're not showing that promise forth in, in their teaching and their living. They're not living it out. God said it would be this way. And while I'm not saying that all those who contradict that are not the faith and you know are not my brothers and sisters in Christ and so forth, uh, who are who are ignorant in this way concerning the law, uh, they are that. They are greatly ignorant and they are greatly deceived uh, because they're doing exactly well, they're doing exactly to, to God's law what Satan did to the garden. Satan did to Eve in the garden. Did God really say? Did he really say? Well, yeah, he did. He did really say. He said that his law would go forth out of Zion. He said his law would continue and be placed in the, the hearts of his new covenant members. Uh, the spirit would come so that we would be compelled to obey his statutes and be careful to obey his rules. So yes, he, he did say that his law should continue and be greatly taught in his new covenant church in these last days in which we live. So, the law continues in the New Covenant, firstly because God promises that it will in Old, Te uh, Old Testament revelation, Old Testament promises, and then secondly, it does so as well because the New Testament shows the very same thing. Uh, Jesus and his New Covenant apostles teach this, teach the continuance of the law. So, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, all of Scripture testifies to this fact. Uh, so, I'll begin in Matthew 22, if you want to look at that with me, but... Uh, Matthew 22, beginning in verse 34, a lawyer who was a part of one of the main religious groups in that day, the Sadducees, asked Jesus a question to test him. And the question he asked was, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? What is the great commandment in the law? What is the, what is the greatest command of God's? And Jesus, the lawgiver in the flesh, answers this way. He says to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, this is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, on these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. On these two commands, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving neighbor as ourselves, on these two hang all, depend all, the law and the prophets. So you know, while the Lord Jesus does give this lawyer what the first and great commandment is, while giving him a second as well, you, know, you notice he does not break them up, though, from the unit that they are. He doesn't break them up from the unit that they are because he then comes back and brings about the reality that all of the law has to do with this. All of the law is about loving the Lord, the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. All of the law is about loving neighbor as ourself. For on these two commands depends the entire law. The churches, the law and prophets depend upon these two commands, far from meaning that the law goes away. Here we have clearly from our Lord that the law shows us how those two commands are actually carried out in our lives. The law shows us how we are to love God and how we are to love neighbor. It explains to us how that looks. You know, church, you, you just think about it. If the law just completely goes away, it's gone, it's done, and we were simply left with the commands to love God and neighbor, then we would just be left with our own subjective opinion on how that looks. Because right? that, that's what you'll hear. Well, now it's just love God and love neighbor. The, the law, you know, because that's that sums up the law. And so now it's just these two commands. We just need to love God and love neighbor. Okay, well, what does that look like? Define that for me. If that depends on the, all the law and prophets, what he's saying is that the law and prophets teach us what that look what that looks like to love God and to love neighbor. Because if you just sum it up to that, again, says who? Now, now we're going back and forth on what that looks like. Well, I think it looks this way to love God and love. I think it's this way to love my neighbor as myself. It doesn't matter what we think. What matters is what God says in his word on what that looks like. 
in the law, in Proverbs. God doesn't leave it up to our opinion. He shows us how we are to love him and neighbor in his law. The Apostle Paul teaches the very same thing in Romans 13. Romans 13, verses 8 to 10, he teaches the same thing. He says, uh, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And then he says, and any other commandment. So not just the ones I just listed, any other command, List any other act. Any other commandment of God's, Paul says, are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So, you know, again, how do I specifically know how to love you as my neighbor? How, how, how can I know with 100% certainty that I am loving you? Do I just go in accordance with how I feel I should? No. I know how to love you as my neighbor as God teaches me in his law, in his righteous commands. Love is the fulfilling of the law. You know, think about, I, I mentioned it before uh, in 1 John 5, 2. It's where he says that God's commandments are not burdensome. But it's where he also talks about how we know that we're loving our brothers when what? When we love God and obey his commandments. We can know that we're loving each other when we love God, when we're devoted to God, and when we obey his commandments. And that's not just New Testament commandments. <laughs> It's all of God's command. So, again, church, far from taking his law away, as the Apostle Paul uh, further says in Romans 3, in Romans 3.31, on the contrary, we uphold the law in the gospel. Uh, there, in, there in Romans 3, at the end there, he's talking about, you know, does this faith that we have make the law void? He says, by no means, by no means at all. We uphold the law in the gospel. The law shows us how we are to live in love for God and neighbor as his people. And then, and then church, furthermore, uh, one of the clearest definitions for sin in Scripture even shows us that from the New Testament. One of the clearest definitions of sin, 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So the apostle says that sin is lawlessness, meaning that sin is that which is what? Against the law. That sin is that which is apart from the law. You were with us when we went through it. Remember the catechism question. Sin is any want of conformity unto. It's, it's a lack. That's what it means to want, not like you're wanting. It's a lack. It's any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. So to not sin, to not sin would be to no longer walk in lawlessness, would be to no longer walk against the law, but to walk in accordance with it. Uh, which is, church, a huge part of why our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus, entered into his own creation, right? To destroy the works of the devil that we as people would no longer walk in sin or walk in lawlessness, but that we would walk in righteousness. Right? That we in the new covenant would walk in God's law that he's placed within us. The Apostle Paul tells us in Titus 2.14, in Titus 2.14 that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness from all lawlessness, from a life apart from the law. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous and desirous for good works. Those works that run hand in hand with his law, that are not contrary to his law because he saved us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purchase us out of a life that is against the law of God to be zealous for good works, remembering and upholding the Lord our God's law and good works. And then, uh, then along with that, and, and lastly under this heading, uh, in, in Jesus clearly teaching the continuance of the law and the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Matthew 5, verse 17 to 19. It's, I mean, it's a very clear statement. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law. So, hey, you know what? If you think... If you have some kind of theology that says, I think Jesus came to abolish the law, you might want to rethink that because he says, don't think that. That's a command. Don't think that. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, 
Not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so, you know, there are many today who from this will try to say that since Christ has fulfilled the law, which he has, he has fulfilled the law, but they'll say since he fulfills the law, then it goes away. Since he fulfills it, he fulfills it, and therefore it goes away. It's, it's abolished because he fulfilled it, so we don't have to follow it anymore because he fulfilled it on our behalf. But, but he, he clearly teaches that to fulfill the law is not to abolish it. Those are two different things. He makes a distinction between them. Right? Do not think I've come to abolish the law. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So those are obviously two different things. To fulfill does not mean to abolish. To fulfill does not mean that it would go away. It couldn't mean that. He very clearly makes a distinction between the two terms. And then afterwards he states that until heaven and earth pass away... Uh, and, and all is accomplished, not an iota, which is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and, and not a dot, it's a tiny pen stroke or part of a letter. Not the, small, the smallest parts of the law will pass away until all is accomplished, until he is finished in what he came to fulfill. <coughs> and because of this, we are not to be slack concerning the law whatsoever. And far from it, Jesus teaches that those who relax one of the least of these commandments and teach others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So there, he's even acknowledging that. There can be some ignorance in this, and you, st you still make it in. But you're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great. And you know, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, if I have the ability, I'd rather be called great in the kingdom of heaven than, than least in the kingdom of heaven. If I have the ability to glorify my God... And to uphold his law as he promises and shows for us several times uh, will be in the lives of his new covenant people. Shows forth that Jesus died to purchase us out of lawlessness, out of sin, and to live this out and to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, well, then, I mean, I want to do that. I want to glorify my God and, and, and be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Which means I'm not to relax his law whatsoever. I'm not to relax his law. I'm to follow his law because he's enabled me to as he's promised. He didn't come to abolish it. I'm to do so because he has taught and commanded me to. But, but as, as he has accomplished and fulfilled the law now in his life, death, and resurrection, there are, as he said, there are, you, you could say, aspects uh, in how the law was followed in its old covenant expression uh, that do pass away. That do pass away. It's not that the law passes away in and of itself. That is never said. Uh, but there are parts or ways in which the law was expressed in the Old Covenant uh, that do pass away in being fulfilled. And he says that. He, he says that upon being accomplished, that there would be parts that would pass away. So certainly as New Covenant Christians, I'm not saying that we obey the law in its Mosaic expression, in its Old Covenant expression. No, as New Covenant Christians, we obey the law in its New Covenant fulfilled expression. That's how I would turn it. It's new covenant fulfilled expression. The law certainly is not abolished, but as it has been fulfilled by Christ Jesus, there is a different way that we approach it in obedience to the law. Now, along with this, we read in Hebrews 7 verse 12. Hebrews 7 12 says, For when there is a change in the priesthood, which there is, as Christ is our great high priest in the new covenant, he is our great high priest. Uh, that's taught very clearly in the book of Hebrews. He says, when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Hebrews 7, 12. And again, it's not that the law in and of itself has changed or passed away, but how we approach it definitely changes as New Covenant Christians. I think some of that is obvious because that's why we don't have the priesthood uh, as they had in the Old Covenant system. We don't have the priesthood. Uh, we don't have the temple. We don't have the sacrifices in the same way they did in the Old Covenant. Because those things find their fulfillment in Christ. But you see, that doesn't mean that we don't have those things at all. Though. We, we do still have a priest. We do still have a sacrifice. We do still have a temple in the new covenant. It just looks different in its new covenant expression. It doesn't mean that those things pass away altogether. It just means the way uh, we approach them is different. We still have those things, but they look different in how we approach them because Christ is the fulfillment now and substance the true substance, the true reality 
of those things. Now he is our once for all great high priest who forever intercedes uh, for us before the Father. Forever intercedes for us before the Father because of his once for all great sacrifice. He is our once for all great sacrifice. We still have sacrifices in the new covenant. Christ is our once for all great sacrifice. We still have a priest. Christ is our once for all true temple. Yes, we are the temple of God, but that's because Christ is the true temple of God in whom we truly come to commune with the Father. And thus in him, we as his people become the temple of God. Christ is the true temple. We've come to truly commune with the Father and worship him. And in Christ, we become his temple. So as I said, definitely how we approach the Old Covenant, you know, the Mosaic Law and, it, and its fulfilled expression changes, but the law in its essence doesn't change. The moral law, uh, the Ten Commandments, they still continue, right? There's simply a summarization of God's law that is binding upon all men because created in the image of God, that law is written on our hearts and our conscience bears witness to it, Romans 2.15. Paul teaches that in Romans 2.15. Even Gentiles that don't have the law, they have it written on their hearts. And if you're wondering what, I mean, the difference between, well, Jeremiah and the New Covenant it would be written in our heart, but that's what they knew regenerated heart not a depraved, wicked heart that wants to use uh, the work of the law and, and our knowledge of the law in, uh, in God's created image in a wicked and selfish way. Right? We, we, we don't, before conversion, we suppress that truth by our unrighteousness. We want to follow it in a way that seems right to us. In conversion, we're given new hearts with the law within in which we want to serve the Lord our God to his glory and for the upbuilding of his people. But the moral law, again, there is summarization of God's law that is binding upon all men. All men have this written on their hearts. That is why all mankind are held accountable to keeping his law. All mankind, Romans 3.19, Romans 3.19, all mankind will be held accountable to the law of God. That's what it says there. Every mouth will be stopped by the law of God, not just Israel. Not just the Jewish, ethnic Jewish people who had the law. Every mouth, all nations will be held accountable to the law of God, uh, God's moral law. And so this is, for example, why the Apostle Paul mentions the fifth commandment to children. He mentions the fifth commandment in Ephesians 6, 1. Honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother. M mother. Mother. That it would be well with you, that you would live long in the land. And he says that, and he doesn't preface it by saying, hey, I know we're not under this law anymore. But it would probably be good if he did that. He doesn't preface it with that. No, he just says it and commands it because it's God's law that we've been upheld to follow. In, in all times and in all ages, our children honor their father and mother. In all times and in all ages, is it wicked not to do so, regardless of what the culture thinks? It's God's moral law. All are upheld to this, not just we as Christians. All are upheld to this. But going along with... Uh, following the law in its fulfilled expression. Uh, this is why, for example, that we honor the Sabbath command. We honor the fourth commandment on the first day of the week instead of the last day of the week, instead of Saturday. Because as Christ has fulfilled the law, in obeying the law in its new covenant fulfilled expression, we rest on the first day of the week when our Lord on that day rested from his works in recreation just as God did in his in creating the world. So the moral law continues the essential basis of the law continues, but the application of it in Christ can look differently. So along with that, you know, we don't have the dietary laws anymore. We don't have the dietary laws anymore. Uh, Mark 7, 19 says very clearly that Jesus uh, declared all foods clean. Acts 10, uh, verse 15 is when Peter has the vision, don't call unclean what I call clean. We don't have the dietary laws anymore. But, you know, that doesn't mean in, in its essence that God doesn't care about how we eat anymore. He still cares about how we eat. We're still to, to eat in a, in a holy way. We're not to use food just uh, simply for our delight. We're to eat and drink to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. And whatever we do, every aspect of our life is to be set apart to the glory of God, even in what we eat and drink. So, so even the, the basis there. Uh, of, of setting apart how we eat and drink. Yeah, we don't have those specific laws uh, as they were in the ceremonial law and its mosaic expression, but still in the new covenant, how we eat matters. How we drink matters. In Christ, we're still to eat and drink in a holy way, not selfishly for our own benefit and delight. 
as the aspects of worship and the ceremonial laws are fulfilled in Christ, along with what I just mentioned about the priests and sacrifices, well, you know, we also, there's still a sense in which we also still continue to keep the feast days as well. It's just, again, their expression changes. For example, in the context of church discipline, the whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul commands the church in that chapter to keep the Passover festival. That's a command for the New Covenant Church to keep the Passover festival, but he doesn't command them to do so in the same way they did in the Old Covenant. Right In the Old Covenant, they would eat the Passover lamb, reminding them of the first Passover in which God passed over the homes of those who had the blood of a spot, spotless lamb uh, spread upon their door, doorposts and their lentils. And they would also eat unleavened bread during this festival, and with that also having to sweep their homes clean of all leaven uh, or yeast within and what we find is that that finds its fulfillment in Christ taking the wrath of God away from us in our sin and giving us the ability to get sin out of his house, to sweep the leaven of sin out of his house in church discipline. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 to 8. We're commanded, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival. Not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil. Right? So he's not talking about like the literal old covenant festival. He's talking about it in its new covenant expression. Let us celebrate it, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, sin, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Cleanse out the old that there would be new. That the, the new man would live in accordance with Christ, not just individually, but collectively in his people. So... You know, beloved, as those who have been enabled and empowered by God to keep his law, uh, we here at Christ as King Reformed Baptist Church do practice and celebrate the Passover festival as we are commanded. Uh, it just looks different now that the fulfillment of the Passover has come in the person and works of Christ Jesus. It, just, it looks different as it's been fulfilled. All of the aspects of the law are still upheld. It's just that apart from their basis in the moral law of the Ten Commandments, the expression of obedience to them in being fulfilled in Christ looks different today because it's been fulfilled. And you know, there's, there's other examples you could give on this, but essentially in how we obey God's law today, it really comes down to a good reformed hermeneutic that is simply we interpret the Old Testament by the New Testament. We interpret the Old Testament by the New. We let the full light and the true reality, the full light of the New, shine on the shadows of the Old. We... Simply, we let Jesus and his apostles tell us how to understand and follow the law and follow the Old Testament and to obey his commands. Uh, how we live out God's law today, we let our Lord, the Lord of the law, the lawgiver in the flesh, tell us how to do so. And his apostles who stand in his place and speak for him show us and tell us how to do so in the New Testament epistles. Uh, but beloved, in closing, may the Lamb receive the full reward for his sufferings which includes the discipling of the nations in his church, as God's law goes forth out of Zion. He died for this. He died uh, that the law would go forth out of Zion. He died that we would be redeemed from all lawlessness and that we would be zealous for good works. And in Christ, Christ is king. In Christ, our God has placed his law within our hearts. He has graciously given us his spirit to compel us to keep it and to live it out. May we be faithful to do so. Amen? Amen. Amen. May we be faithful to do so. May we be faithful to encourage one another in this all the more as we see his day uh, of ultimate fulfillment draw near. May we say as we serve our Lord, uh, eagerly awaiting the coming day of God, serving him uh, now, uh, loving his church, may we say to our God with the psalmist, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Oh, how I love your law is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, verse 97. May he bless the teaching and preaching uh, this evening. May he bless our worship this evening. And uh, I, I don't have a review. That's why we didn't get any papers uh, this evening. But if there are any comments or questions, I can answer those. Uh, but apart from that, we can pray and conclude.